Okay, we have David Sandino speaking on drought, delta, groundwater depletion, making sense of California water. David Sandino served as chief counsel for the California Department of Water Resources under an appointment by Governor Schwarzenegger and now serves as senior staff counsel. He received a Fulbright Fellowship to teach in Russia on international environmental law at the Moscow State Academy. David's academic career has centered on teaching natural resources at several academic institutions, including our very own Sacramento State University. His presentation will provide an overview of California's hydrology, water infrastructure, and regulatory framework and discuss how California manages its water supply during dry years. We are pleased to introduce David Sandino on this very timely topic. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone, uh, on a Friday afternoon, so we can talk about um, the water issues of the day and how California is coping with the current dry conditions. So I have a presentation for you for about 40 minutes or so, and then I look forward to your questions at the end. So I'm gonna share my screen now, and you can follow along with the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm sharing my screen. The first uh, screen, hopefully everyone can see, is uh, the title of my presentation on drought, delta, and groundwater depletion making sense of California water. And what I'm trying to show is we have a variety of different topics that influence California water. I picked three of the most important, but I've left out quite a few. So this is just an introduction to this important subject. So what I'm proposing to cover is um, a discussion about the drought, which has, I think, uh, dominated the news. We're in our third dry year in a row. I'm going to explain, quote unquote, what is meant by a drought, at least how I see it. And uh, then from there, transition as to what are some of the impacts of these dry conditions on the state as a whole. And then carry that over that these dry conditions are felt with groundwater. Groundwater is a major source of water supply for cities and farmers. And because of the dry conditions, we rely more on groundwater in these kinds of years. And then I'm going to wrap it up by connecting all this into perhaps the most important topic when it comes to California water and understanding of the Sacramento uh, San Joaquin uh, Bay Delta, commonly referred to in the Sacramento area as the Delta. You know, folks are familiar with that. And I'm going to describe a little bit about what's going on in the Delta in these dry years. And at the end, I can't resist. I want to make a few predictions for the future. So let's start with I think one of the more powerful slides uh, dealing with California water, California hydrology. And this is a slide that shows precipitation and snow, snowfall on average in California. Now this year, of course, it's, it's a dry year in, uh, in Northern California. But the key points I'd like to emphasize is this, is this in this slide so we can all start from the same spot. Let's draw a line between San Francisco and Sacramento. And north of that line, more or less, is Northern California. And south of that line is, is Central Valley, Southern California. And what quickly emerges is north of this line, you see colors that are purple and blue. Those are signs of high precipitation, anywhere from 30, 40, 50, 60 inches per year in average years. But below that line, things change rapidly. Uh, with uh, precipitation in lower numbers, less than 10, 15 inches per year. Uh, the dry parts of the states, indeed the desert regions of the states. Take a look at the San Joaquin Valley. On average, it has less precipitation than uh, the southeastern parts of the state, the Mojave area. And so consequently, what we have is a state that has a very mal distribution of water supply. I mean, that's how the hydrologists would look at it or the sociologists, they would see that we have most of our water in, in Northern California. However, our largest share of populations are in Southern California. So we have to figure out a way to manage California water to make sure that water is available where people are living or where the farms are growing crops. So 
I've already alluded to, and if, if you're living in the Sacramento area, you feel it, right? It, it's, it's been dry the last few years. And I always like to start, well, what do we mean by that? So drought is a persistent and abnormal moisture defi deficiency, having adverse consequences on people, wildlife, and vegetation. Key parts for me are the consequences, we're gonna talk about that, but an emphasis on persistence and abnormal. So when we're thinking about drought conditions, I'm, uh, I live in Northern California too. The focus is on dry conditions in Northern California. Uh, the dry conditions are not abnormal in Palm Springs area, for instance, the Palm Desert. That's persistent there, but normal. But we're focusing on drought. We're focusing on conditions that are persistent and abnormal. And the question that we should be teeing up and thinking about are the dry conditions that we've experienced the last few years, including this rain year, really abnormal? Or is this the new normal? If so, then that's gonna change our thinking about whether or not we're enduring a drought right now. Maybe this is the um, expectations for the future. Okay, I have some slides here that were prepared by a uh, think tank that deals with water and other important issues of Public Policy Institute of California. You may be familiar with them. They're fabulous. I have, I'm referencing them in some of my materials. And what they show here is just uh, precipitation. I have it circled here uh, with um, uh, bars that are above the line, above the x-axis. Those are above average years and below uh, that x-axis are below average precip years. And you can look from about 2000 to uh, 2020, 2021, we've been below average in more years than we've been average. So we've had a cumulative effect of dry conditions and that makes it harder for us to manage our water supply this year, which has been another dry year. And just to add to the conversation as food for thought is we've also had a series of years that are hot. Um, this bar graph at the bottom shows uh, temperatures in Fahrenheit above average. And if you look from uh, 2000 to 2020, we've seen that we've had more years that are hotter than the average, higher temperatures. And this creates also stress for our water management because it enhances the dry conditions on the ground, makes it harder, for instance, to make sure that water is available for farmers and water, for instance, that we're storing in our, our reservoirs are more likely to evaporate. So we have um, issues to think about and, that, and if this becomes a new normal where we have higher temperatures, that's gonna increase the challenge. So it's not just rainfall, it's also temperatures. So I have a, a, a just, a, uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you. It's not as if dry conditions uh, that are, have endure for a year or two or three or four are unusual. We have good records, good scientific records, technical records of dry conditions in the California. I've listed some of the uh, droughts of record um, um, and from 1929, 1934, very dry years um, coincides with uh, the Dust Bowl period in the mid Midwest. And there was a correlation there for dry weather all over the US at that time. We've had some recent experiences with dry years. So we shouldn't just think of the 2022 period as our only recent experience. You may recall 2011 to 2014 was very dry and California was scrambling uh, to meet its water supply needs. So we, we have, we've had issues this, the past 10 years, the past 20 years, all centered around dry conditions. Um, I couldn't resist to include uh, some slides from Chaco Canyon because we also have ways to go back in time and make some estimates about hydrology, looking at tree ring studies. And what we've seen is that uh, there's different time periods in history. We've also had dry periods, including in California. And we've had estimates from these tree ring studies that uh, that uh, we've had dry periods that have lasted for more than 20 years here in California. And the reason I, I show, show Chaco Canyon, not because it's in California, uh, of course it's in New Mexico, but uh, the indications were that that civilization adjusted 
by dry conditions by vacating that area. So we don't want that to happen in California. We need to manage our water supply uh, wisely. So I'll give you some suggestions on how we're doing that. So just a couple more about the dry conditions. I want to show you a uh, slide here about California. I call this kind of the slide of pain. This is created by the U.S. Drought Monitor. It's a, a combination of federal agencies that kind of give us the pulse qualitatively of how dry things are, how wet they are. Well, this is April 5th, 2022, their most recent slide. The more red, the more dark colors, the more painful it is, the more we're in dry conditions. And you can see a large part of California now is experiencing, according to the drought monitor, that they would classify it under D3 extreme drought. Um, so that's not where we wanna be in terms of water management. Uh, where, how did we get here? Here's a series of slides. This was from April to 2021. We had dry conditions over a year ago. So if you go back in time, we've been facing dry conditions for a while. And in September of 2021, if you can recall, we were really sweating it uh, in terms of state water supply. And this was the qualitative measurement by the drought monitor that almost the entire state was in extreme drought conditions. But if you think back to last fall, we had a, a cloud uh, burst in October, a very heavy rain period for October, and everybody was optimistic, including myself, that we would have a good water year. And then November rolled around, we got nervous again, it was pretty dry, but then a very wet December, right? A very wet December, and everybody was encouraged that this drought that we've been in, the, the, the things have changed. And if you look at number three in January, that's how the drought monitor assessed it. Everything was looking good. But um, as fate would have it, the last few months have been very dry. January, very dry. February, very dry. March, mostly dry. We've had a couple uh, small um, precipitation events in Northern California in April. But overall, we're heading now in the middle of April for still very dry conditions, and that's going to influence our water supply. Um, we can go further back, and you can see, if you wish, kind of the range from 2016 to 2021. And after we had 2017, it was a very wet year in April 2017. Um, things were looking very good for the state, but you can see how it's kind of deteriorated since then, and uh, especially now in 2021, 2022, we're back in dry conditions for the state. I should point out uh, that I'm focused on California, but California's water is more complex. We're influenced not just by hydrology in the state of uh, California, but also in the Colorado River watershed. And you may ask, why is that the case? Um, well, as you can see, California is at the bottom of that watershed, and California is tied to water supply from the Colorado River. And California receives more water from the Colorado River for farmers and cities than other, any other state over 4 million acre feet on average. So as goes Colorado, so does uh, California's water conditions to a, a, a certain extent. And unfortunately for everyone, the Colorado Basin as a whole also has been dry. So we're kind of in a double whammy right now in California. We have dry conditions in Northern California, but we also have dry conditions in the Colorado, which makes our water management challenges even harder. So uh, what are some of the impacts associated with water. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly, but you can sense that in dry years, um, there's impacts to all the major users of water, including fish and wildlife. Our wildlife suffers during these dry periods. We've seen uh, population drops, for instance, of fish species tied to hydrology. It makes it more difficult for our urban areas to uh, meet their water demand. They often engage in rationing or other kinds of emergency measures to make it through. And of course, our farmers especially are impacted uh, by dry years. 
our, our farm community, our agricultural community in California, in the Central Valley, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley, Salinas Valley, uh, Imperial uh, Valley areas. These, these areas um, use a large share of water supply. In fact, about 80% of the consumptive use of water in California goes to our farmers. And during dry years, the farmers are the ones that are typically most challenged. Um, I'm hope, uh, I hope uh, I don't jinx the cities, but cities have more tools at their fingertips to manage through the droughts, but farmers have the toughest time. So um, I'm gonna start and talk a little bit about, okay, what have we done in California to, I like to describe, equalize that first chart that I showed you, first graph on California hydrology. Mother Nature made it that most of the water supply is falling in Northern California, but we have a distribution of population and farms to the South in uh, Central Valley and Southern California. So what did the state, do to try to move water around the state to give the population access to water that falls in Northern California. And I just wanted to share this with you, uh, the uh, 1962 speech that was given by President Kennedy near Los Banos uh, to initiate the construction of San Luis Dam. San Luis Dam is a joint federal and state dam that serves as a key reservoir for the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project that we're gonna talk about a bit. And you can watch that link at your leisure if you want, but it's a very inspiring speech by President Kennedy, I think as good as his first inaugural, uh, describing the benefits of supplying water to the citizens of California through that reservoir. So what President Kennedy was dedicating that day was the uh, uh, San Luis uh, Reservoir, which is a key uh, component of the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, which are two large water projects that distribute water that falls in Northern California, remember that graph, to the rest of the state. Most states don't have any water project to this side, California, we're the only state, we have two large water projects, one by the federal government and one by, built by the state of California. So quickly, what about the, the federal water project? Well, it was built by the Bureau of Reclamation in the Department of Interior under the Reclamation Act of 1902. And the Reclamation Act of 1902 uh, was an invention that allowed for government, and consider the year 1902, the federal government to take, act, take action to develop the Western 17 states, who at that time in our history were not as well developed as the East, had low populations, and one of the limiting factors was water supply. So the federal government intervened because the states didn't have the capacity to do it, and uh, private, the private sector could do it as well to actually build water supply facilities to distribute water to farms in the West. Um, and California benefited from that by the construction of the Central Valley Project. Now we could take a whole course on the Central Valley Project, but just in a nutshell, it's a series of reservoirs and canals that distribute water in Northern California and to Southern California. We're, we're most familiar with a key feature of the Central Valley Project in the Sacramento area, Folsom Dam. Uh, in addition to Folsom Dam, Shasta Dam, which is California's largest red, uh, reservoir located north of Redding, is a federal reservoir. And it was built during World War II. And I always like to share with folks that it showed the capacity, the economic capacity of the United States during the middle of World War II were able to build the largest dam in California, and it's still the largest storage dam in California with over three and a half million acre feet of water. So the federal government takes water and supplies it to the rest of the state, but uh, uh, Governor Brown, Pat Brown, not Jerry, decided, well, the state of California could get in the same kind of business and built its own large water project, the state water project that was approved by the voters in 
November 8th, 1960, by only 1%. Think about this. What would the state look like if the percentage had been the other way? We wouldn't have had a state water project, but the voters approved it. And that project was developed. Its flagship reservoir is Lake Oroville, um, located not too far from the city of Oroville, city of Chico. Chico. It is the highest reservoir in the United States, not the biggest capacity, but the highest reservoir. And that supplies water to the state water project customers. So how, does these large, how do these large water projects work? Well, what they do is take water from Northern California, remember that graph, and then that water flows into the Sacramento River and into the Delta. We'll get to the Delta a little bit more toward the end. And uh, in a state of nature, that water flows into the San Francisco Bay, this fresh water, and then out mixes with the ocean. Well, what was designed by the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project was to build a system of reservoirs to store that water, release it in a controlled way, and then divert it from the Delta, not too far from Sacramento, even closer to Tracy, and then send that water by a system of aqueducts and canals into the Bay Area, into the San Joaquin Valley, uh, into the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo, San, uh, Santa Barbara, over the Hatchapees and into the Los Angeles Inland Empire area. Essentially, what we've done is change that graph. Now we can take water that falls in Northern California and distribute it evenly um, across the entire state. So that was the vision of these large water projects. And these were the visions of California in 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960 that has brought us to where we are today, that we have a very integrated water supply system in California and parts of the states that are talking about drought, even if they're normally dry, they're focused on Northern California because that's where they get their water. Here's a map that shows the regions of California that get water from Northern California. So the map to the left, I hope you can see my cursor, that's areas that receive water from the state water project. And it includes uh, Kern County, the Central Coast, and, and Los Angeles. The graph to the right, the colored areas, those are regions of the state that receive water from the Central Valley Project. That project was more focused on agriculture deliveries, not on urban deliveries. But you combine these two projects, both of them are receiving most of their water from Northern California. And when it's a dry year like this year, there's less water to distribute to the farmers in the cities. And that's not a good thing because as I mentioned, these uh, urban areas and agriculture areas, they depend on this Northern California water. I couldn't resist sharing with you uh, that uh, we lost the, the water community in the Sacramento region, um, <clears throat> lost a good friend, Joan Didion, who liked to write about California water. And she wrote about the State Water Project. She visited on several occasions during the 70s and describing the folks, these engineers and hydrologists and scientists that operate these water projects, essentially acting uh, like God and being able to move water around the state. So if you're interested in her writings on California water, I think you'll find them very interesting. So where do we stand then? Can I do an impact assessment of how, how our reservoirs and how our large water projects uh, stand? I realize you're not gonna be able to see this very closely, uh, but I just wanted to show you that, that this part of it, these two uh, areas that I have circled represent the amount of water that should be in our two large reservoirs that I mentioned, Shasta and uh, Oroville. And uh, the top line, the one to the left is Shasta, the one to the right is Oroville. Uh, the bar is where they should be at this time. Basically, in, in April, our reservoir should be mostly full under average conditions. Above average, they probably completely full. But what you can see is for Shasta to the left and Oroville to the right, that green line that crosses that cylinder 
Uh, below it is the blue uh, volume, and that volume doesn't even approach closely to that green line, which means those reservoirs are empty. I just drove up to Shasta uh, two weeks ago, just uh, on my way to Oregon, and it's shocking how low it is for April. We'd like to have that reservoir full. So it's no surprise we've been in dry conditions for the last three years. We would expect our reservoirs to be lower, but it's still eye-opening because we'd like them to be full right now. Well, these low reservoirs then are gonna affect deliveries from both the State Water Project and Central Valley Project because we don't have enough water and storage to meet supplies. So how much, where, where do we stand in terms of water delivery? So I'm just gonna focus on the State Water Project State Water Project um, has an allocation system where every year it announces how much water is going to be delivered. Is it 100% of the requested amount, which is 4 million acre feet, or is it something less? And it's directly tied to hydrology. And you can see these numbers jumping around, but in the olden days when we had wetter hydrology, the project was, was delivering about 100% of the requested demand, but Things started changing in 2000 when the hydrology started shifting. And you can see in 2001, it only delivered about 40%. Keeps going and going and going. But as the years get drier, like 2014, the project only delivered 5% of the water that it had planned to deliver historically. So this year is a, has been a dry year. The two previous years before it are dry. The announced allocation by the state is 5% of the water supply. So that means all those regions that that project delivers fresh water to are only gonna get 5% of the requested amount, which means they're gonna have to find other ways to supply their uh, water to their customers, either through conservation or other sources. And for some uh, regions, um, there are many other sources. So I don't wanna give you a false impression that each region is completely dependent on these large water projects. That's inaccurate. Each region of the state by region, counties, cities, have local water supplies too. Maybe they have local reservoirs, maybe they have groundwater. So each region of the state, each county, each city, each water agency has plans to deal with dry conditions, so-called uh, integrated regional water management, urban water management plans, agricultural water management plans. They have a system of, measure, uh, of, of uh, measures that allow them to take action in dry years. Some of these cause impacts though, relating to water conservation, uh, uh, relating to higher prices so they can go out and purchase water, so they have consequences. So I'm hoping you walk away from this too, that California water is complex and where you live will uh, describe perhaps your current water situation different than your neighbor 100 miles to the north. Uh, the state has uh, taken action to address uh, dry conditions. Uh, Governor Newsom has issued several drought de declarations in the last few years. The governor before him, Governor Brown, dealing with dry conditions, drought conditions, also has issued drought issued uh, drought declarations. Governor Schwarzenegger before him did as well, which to me is a sign of the times that wow, we are having these continuing series of drought years, and maybe we need to kind of change our thinking a little bit that these drought conditions are more are 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 the new normal. Some of the things that the governor declared and asked the citizens of California to do, which seemed to be very prudent, more conservation, water transfers. If some water agency happens to have a surplus supply, can they sell it to an agency that needs that water? Financial assistance to our disadvantaged communities, our small uh, communities that rely on small water distribution systems maybe assistance to them so that they can make sure they have a water supply. And then um, reducing some of the environmental regulation in order to uh, make sure that water is delivered uh, a suspension of the California Environmental Quality Act or activities that are directly related to the drought. So the state has acted. So I suggested that um, each region is different 
And I focus a lot on the San Joaquin Valley. I grew up in Merced and worked on a farm. So I've seen how important water is firsthand to that valley. And um, one of the consequences for dry years and a reduction in water supply deliveries from the two large water projects. So think again, water coming from Northern California diverted to the Delta of the San Joaquin Valley. If that's not available to the cities and farmers in San Joaquin Valley that supply, they look for other sources. And their primary go-to source is groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley. And in the San Joaquin Valley, I think everyone knows on this call is a unique valley, large valley, very dry, showed with the graph, but a prime, the prime, perhaps the prime agricultural region in the United States, producing many crops that can't be produced elsewhere. And that agricultural industry is uh, very reliant on the water supply that comes from Northern California when it's not available. They turn to their local reservoirs if that exists, but also the groundwater. So I want to point out that the entire state has uh, a dependence on groundwater. So these graphs here, this is the total water use in the San Joaquin Valley's top graph. This, um, uh, this is the Tulare Lake, San Joaquin area. Here's the Sac Valley. The smaller bar is how much of that total water supply comes from groundwater. So you can see from the entire state, almost every region of the state uses groundwater. It's just that the Central Valley uses more of it. We're very reliant on groundwater, especially the San Joaquin Valley. So um, that extensive groundwater use has its own consequences, its own environmental consequences. The ability to supply water uh, from the ground isn't infinite, right? There's a finite pool there, and we, as a state, have been pumping groundwater for about 100 years now. And this has resulted in overdraft and subsidence. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So first, overdraft. Basically, we're pumping more water out of that ground that is recharged naturally or intentionally. And over time, the pool is de depleted. It's just like thinking about overdraft with your checking account or my checking account. <laughs> Spend more than what goes in there. Um, eventually, that pool becomes depleted and it can't be used anymore. Well, this is a, 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 a graph that shows different wells. And whenever you see a red spot in the San Joaquin Valley, that means there's been a drop in groundwater levels 20, 25 feet during that time period. And that what happens during these dry years, the um, uh, farmers and, and, and cities, they turn more to groundwater if it's available. And that adds to this issue about depletion. Ideally, we'd like to have our, our groundwater basins full, but that is not the case, and we, we overdraft them and overuse them, uh, especially during dry years. The other issue that we face during these dry periods are um, land subsidence. And land subsidence is exactly what it says. Because of the depletion of water in the aquifer, the lands drop. This is a physical negative effect as a result of over groundwater use. The geologists tell me that the most impacted area, not just in California, but the United States, is the San Joaquin Valley. With a depletion of groundwater that has caused the land to drop as, as much, according to this grass, 8.5 meters, but even more, 30, 40 feet of, of, of land that has dropped. So if you were standing on an area in uh, 1925, in 1997, that would be the new top of that earth. It had dropped that far um, in that time period from 25 to 27 due to groundwater use. And that causes all kinds of challenges, uh, including problems with infrastructure. You can imagine not all things uh, drop equally, and this caused road problems, aqueduct problems. In fact, the aqueducts that deliver water from the Delta to the Central Valley in Southern California, because of subsidence, their capacity to deliver water has been reduced. So even in wet years, we have challenges delivering the water. So this is a major problem for California. Well, in 2014, the state responded, uh, the governor and the legislature by attempting to reduce 
uh, groundwater overdrafts and subsidence. You'll hear a lot about this in the water community called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Nobody calls it that, they call it SIGMA. In essence, what it did, it said that from now on, California would have to come up with a way to reduce uh, these unsustainable uh, impacts, uh, including overdrafts and sub subsidence. Water would have to be better managed in California. This, the governor and the legislature gave that management responsibilities to local agencies. So all around the state, local agencies have developed plans to stop subsidence, to uh, stop groundwater overdraft. So that way in the future, water would be available in these basins for, for generations. And the, the um, other part of the legislation was if for some reason the locals don't do their job, maybe they're just shy, I don't know, but if they don't come up with a sustainable groundwater management plan, the state can intervene, the State Water Resources Control Board. So we inaugurated a new day in California, new policies that have tried to stop these unsustainable impacts, overdraft and, and the subsidence. So we're gonna close by, I wanna enter the Delta. And I know this is an area that I'm sure that has been visited by many folks on this call. It's a special, place, right? I live in Yolo County, so I'm part of the Delta environment. And uh, what do we mean by the Delta? Well, it's complicated, but uh, generally we kind of have the interior Delta. This is where the Sacramento, the San Joaquin River and Eastside streams connect in this maze of sloughs and waterways and islands. A unique ecosystem because it's an interior Delta. These rivers aren't connecting here on, on the coast, they connect in the interior part of California. And from there, they flow into uh, San Pablo Bay and San Francisco Bay and out to the ocean. You can picture this ecosystem as being unique. I, I teach a class just on this for a day. So I'm just giving you one minute here. One thing to visualize is that you have fresh water coming in from the Sacramento San Joaquin East sides and you have salt water, saline water, coming in twice the day due, due to the tides. And they mix here in the Delta. And when we have very wet conditions, then the fresh water wins the, the fight between the salt water and pushes it out toward the bay. But in, very, but in, in wet conditions, the uh, uh, fresh water wins. In dry conditions, it goes the other way. More salt, saline water intrudes into the Delta. And that's important because um, our diversions under these large water projects I mentioned are in the South Delta near Tracy. So I'm pointing to it on the cursor. That's where the entry is to the state water project and the Central Valley project. Two large pumping systems that take water from the Delta and deliver it all over California. And of course they want to deliver, or we want to deliver fresh water. They don't want salt water, they need fresh water. So what that means is, is that the Delta is a managed ecosystem in terms of water uh, quality. It's managed to keep the, the fresh water, uh, keep the Delta fresh. So that way the interior Delta stays fresh and also the water that's diverted to the California is fresh. So every day, this, this is what Joan Didion is writing about, is that the reservoir operators are tracking water quality in the Delta if the Delta gets too saline, they release water from our reservoirs and push that salt out so way the Delta can be maintained in a freshwater environment. So there's a, a point to the, where the pumps are. Now the Delta has some health issues, environmental issues. And one is the protection of our native fish and the Delta smelt is a, is a freshwater small fish in the Delta and its population is suffering, has been suffering, very close to extinction. It's, a, it's, it's on the Endangered Species Act. And the challenge as we move forward is to find a way to protect this fish and still be able to meet the water supply issues uh, associated with, with the state as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of causes uh, for impacts of Delta smelt. Maybe we can get to those Delta smelt decline. We can talk about those perhaps what's being done in the questions. Another issue in the Delta, is the Delta has its own subsidence issues, not caused by groundwater pumping, but, but caused by uh, use of Delta land, which is very fertile. And if you've ever visited to the Delta, it's, it's pretty surprising because it's a system 
of islands that have levees that protect these islands from flooding because these islands, the ones that you can see in red, they're actually below sea level. So if you stood on the edge of an island, you'd be essentially at sea level, but if you look back toward the island itself, the island's 25 feet below sea level. Mean, meaning that the levees keep the water from these islands uh, from, from flooding. But that's a real challenge because the levees are not perfect. In 2004, I was on duty, and this is the levee break that occurred on Jones Track in the central, central uh, delta. That levee broke. The entire island flooded in three days. It took us two years to pump it out at the tune of several hundred million dollars. We were fortunate that we were able to, to plug that island break and, and stop it from flooding because in the past, we have had, had Delta, Delta Islands that have failed. Frank Tract failed in 1938. And what we have then in the Delta is not a natural ecosystem for Frank's Tract, but sort of a freshwater lake that isn't very good habitat for the natural fish uh, in the lake. So a uh, couple little things to close this. Um, there's big plans all the time for the Delta, and I'm sure you've heard about this in the Sacramento area. On uh, the table for consideration is a draft conveyance facility that would uh, draft. Uh, it, it's, it's still being considered, that's why it's draft. Take a, a, a pipeline that would take water from the Sacramento River, deliver it underground to these pumping facilities in the South Delta, and the theory that this would provide potentially less environmental impacts caused by, by the diversions from these large projects, and also a level of water supply security if there's island failures. So that is in the environmental review stage. Keep your eyes tuned to that if you're interested. So I'll close here with just a couple things about the future. One is that we um, are in an era of well-documented climate change. Well, that's affecting how we're gonna manage water supply in the future. Maybe we're in that period now with these series of dry years, but our, our water supply system depends on reservoir storage, both in the Sacramento and San Joaquin, San Joaquin Valley, but it also depends on snowpack because under ideal conditions, the snow that falls under in the Sierra melts slowly and then that enters into that stream and that's available for environmental protection and also for water deliveries. Well, what we're getting is lower and lower snowpacks melting sooner and sooner, which makes it harder to actually manage our water surplus, that water system that was designed for a more gradual snowpack. So we have, we have these challenges. Think of the snow that you see in the Sierras as storage reservoirs that are now not functioning well, just like our storage reservoirs in Shasta and Oroville are not full. And the other issue that we're dealing with in climate change that I wanna mention is sea level rise. I just described how the Delta is at sea level and to keep the Delta health, healthy and those islands free from flooding, there's a series of levees. But as the sea rises, it becomes more difficult because that will, that will cause a rise in the Delta to keep those, uh, those levees safe and those islands secure. So I'm gonna put it all together here at the end, um, just mention to you some things I see in the future. First of all, um, yes, I, I, I think you should, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in government, work for government, and there's um, regional plans, local plans to deal with dry conditions. Uh, so I don't want folks to come away with a false impression. Sometimes you've read the new head headlines. No one's ever thought about, well, California may have a dry year. We have thought about it a lot. And we do have programs and plans to try to uh, deal with those dry conditions. And as things get drier, then the programs kick in even more. That doesn't mean it's painless, but there are programs. Uh, the other thing is, um, don't forget fish and wildlife. I, I tend to focus on conversations with cities and farms, but the fish and wildlife protection is, is the key one. And it's, and it's very difficult to maintain uh, during dry years when we have a lot of voices uh, pointing out how difficult it is for our cities and farms to manage. So we're trying to strike the right balance. Um, I don't think it hurts to hope for uh, uh, divine intervention. We could sure use a wet year next year or maybe the next few months, not so hot and a little bit of rain. I'd favor that. 
Um, and then, of course, making sure that our water conservation uh, that is so important becomes ingrained with everybody. I mean, everything that we can do, both for on the urban level and at the farm level, really matters because, as you can see, if we're saving water in Northern California, that benefits the entire state through this integrated supply system. And um, also, we're taking a harder look, the state is, okay, if these dry conditions really are going to be persistent from now and the next 34 years, we may have to update our approaches to um, water management and get um, tighter all the time. So I'll leave you with this. Um, in part of my suggested reading, the book came out two years, and I'd feel that I'm not doing my job if I didn't mention to you, because it's the best book on California water ever, or certainly in the last 20, 30 years, Mark Arax, great author. And he wrote a book on the dream, dream, called The Dreamt Land um, about California water issues. And he's just a fabulous writer. So if you're interested, check that book out if you haven't read it and uh, leave you with a painting of the Delta. I'm sure you could identify the painter, Wayne Tebow. One of his great subject areas was to write about the Delta, wonderful paintings. And uh, he passed away too recently. So we lost another good friend to California water. So I'll leave you with that. And I look forward to your questions. And um, I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen. And hopefully you can see me. Yes. Thank you so much, David. Wow. I mean, incredible information. <laughs> um, so much chat and so many questions and compliments on all the info you're giving us in the questions. So I'm trying to organize over here. Um, let's get started at the basic question. Can you actually define what drought is for us? Because it seems like in Northwestern California, there's a lot more rainfall there, but how is drought defined in those places? Is it the same? That sort of stuff. Yeah, so yeah, so that, that's that's a good question how, how we kind of look at it. So right. So if if we were down in the Palm Springs area, the desert area, it rains there, but the rainfall is less, 10 inches a year, 12 inches a year. So uh, it looks dry all the time, right? The vegetation has acclimated it to that. So in a dry dry year down there, maybe it maybe it's half as much. Um, versus Northern, Northern California, you can see the rainfall totals, 20, 25 inches in Sacramento. Uh, further north you go on the Sierras, higher up you go, the numbers are, are higher. So the, the drought depends in, in layperson's term, where are you, where are you sitting? And um, what are the water supply consequences for that? Well, drought, when we're in Sacramento area, we're all, always focused on Northern California water supply. We don't pay too much about attention what's going down in LA or Palm Springs because those areas where it rains, they don't influence water supply distribution to the entire state. The only part of the state that really matters for water supply for the entire state is Northern California. So that's generally when we talk about drought, we're focusing on Northern California because that's the area where the water has historically been most abundant. That's the most rainfall, the most snow. And that's where the water is distributed from Northern California. So Bay Area is hooked on Northern California water. San Joaquin Valley, hooked on Northern California. Central Valley, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Central Coast, same way. Southern California, same way. Okay. That's a good way to look at it. Um, let's see, we got a number of questions asking about the sites reservoir. They're asking about the costs and the benefits. Can you give us a little bit of that? Yeah, so I'm glad, another good question. So the state is, is always trying to um, look at ways to improve its water supply system as a whole. And sites reservoir is a reservoir that is proposed, it's been proposed for 40 years, so it's not a new idea. It's near the city of Maxwell. If you drive from downtown Sacramento, you can get to the Sites Valley area in about an hour and a half. And the idea is, is to take water from the Sacramento River during very uh, heavy rainfall flow periods, pump that water up 
into the site's reservoir. So an important thing about sites, the water that it would store doesn't come primarily from the valley that it sits in. It comes from water that's pumped uphill from the Sacramento River. That reservoir uh, is going to be funded in part, if it does get built, from money that the voters, you and I, voted on in 2014. There was a large water bond, uh, $7.5 billion that we voted on, and a chunk of that money was set aside for new reservoirs, and one of those reservoirs is sites. They would, they would get um, uh, over, um, over um, a share of, of, of that money to build that reservoir. It's in the planning stage. They, there's an EIR that's out on the streets and it's the environmental analysis of it. They have a lot more work to do, funding issues. And uh, it's a controversial project, so I'm, I'm sure there's more to be said about it. If it got built, it would supply water to some of the, the farm regions downstream near the city of Calusa. And also some of that water would be available for the uh, San Joaquin Valley in Southern California. So it would provide some water supply. One takeaway from it though, is it's not gonna solve uh, the kind of conditions we have now. It would be an incremental benefit at most. Okay. Uh, I'm realizing how little time we have. So I'm so sorry, everyone, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. But um, a lot of people were also curious about agriculture answers. So I know you said you grew up on a farm, but people are curious about, um, has there been any talk of eliminating water guzzling crops like almonds or cotton in the Central Valley? And yeah, is, yeah. is there going to be an environmental impact requirement placed on farmers, anything like that? Yeah, so agricultural water use is um, you know, well studied, well regulated, and it's a big part of the conversation. What do we do in dry years like this when 80% of our, of our water supply, if you, a consumptive water supply, so if you want to put total water use in California, we could dedicate some to the environment, some to cities and farms. Well, the water that we dedicate to cities and farms, about half of it goes to our agricultural community. All right, but one thing to think about too, when we have water going to agriculture, if you're a city dweller like myself, you're still a beneficiary of agricultural water use because you eat and wear clothes that's produced by that. So it's a complicated story. So what is going on in the agricultural community in terms of water use is important. There's been a lot of try to change to push agriculture into more efficient water use. Um, and you can see that just driving around California where flood irrigation used to dominate. Now you see a lot of drip irrigation. But you also, as you pointed out, you're also seeing in California, and this is a market response for the last decade, a lot of permanent crops, almonds, pistachios. And that creates new challenges because the amount of water they use is significant, but even more importantly, it's it, uh, the, uh, the farmer that is, is growing those crops they need the water even in dry years, right? They need it in dry years because if they were uh, growing crops that weren't permanent, perhaps they could fallow. So what the permanent crop, almond, pistachios, which is a market reaction, those crops have made it more, our, our, our water supply uh, uh, more inelastic. You know, we need to provide that water to keep it going. If we don't, then those crops will then will fail. So, this has created more challenges for water management in California. And, um, and, and we can see some of that after you drive along uh, Highway 5 and, and, uh, and in the San Joaquin Valley, how that's happened. Mm, yeah. OK, well, I think um, I'll sum up a few questions into one for our last question. Um, a bunch of people are asking questions around desanitization plans and that process. Uh, can you tell us about results we're seeing or, or future thoughts yeah, on for that? Sure. So, so uh, California is in a fortunate position compared to uh, non-coastal states. We've, we've, got, we've got a big water supply, uh, but it's all salt water there in the Pacific. But we can turn to it. We have the technology today. We can turn to it for water supply. It just 
a question of expense um, and environmental impact. So the city of San Diego made that decision about 10 years ago that it was going to turn to the Pacific Ocean for a share of its water supply, 50,000 acre feet of water online. And it's there almost all the time. It doesn't depend on dry years. The only time it's not available if they have maintenance issues. And, and that water that they've got a price on it, about $1,000 an acre foot, which you know, that's, that's in the ballpark for Delta water. So that, that is a solution for areas on the coast and more areas have been looking into desal. The Monterey area is considerate, it's controversial, but it's there. Uh, um, uh, Huntington Beach area considering it. So what we're gonna see is probably more conversation and potentially more desal plans built. The state of California in that bond measure that we voted on in 2014, set money aside to pursue more desal. So that I think is a trend that we will see more and more of. Great, thank you for that response. Uh, so I, as I said, we have a lot of interest in this. So uh, I want everyone to know that David was kind enough to give us info, more info about his presentation and where to go off from that. And we'll have that attached to our YouTube video. David, thank you so much for all this great information. So many people were invested in this topic. And now we'll hand it back over to Michelle to close things out. David, thank you so much for that timely, important, and concerning topic. In appreciation of your presence today at the forum, we're giving you an honorary membership in the Renaissance Society and a monetary donation to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund. Again, thank you for a very, very interesting topic. My pleasure and thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm always encouraged when I, I see a lot of folks that are interested in water because we need that. We need educated citizens to be water experts and ad, ad, advocate for protecting our water supplies and our fish and wildlife. So thank you for inviting me. You. Remember, Renaissance members, that the forums are recorded and archived. You could go to the Renaissance Society website homepage and click on recordings or go to youtube.com and search the Renaissance Society Forums Committee. Next week, we have another interesting topic with Dr. Ryan Quist as the Behavioral Health Director in Sacramento County and is the vice president for this County Behavioral Health Directors Association, where he co-chairs its medical policy committee, medic, policy committee, pardon me. In Sacramento County, his focus is, his focus is on mental health and sub, substance abuse services for the homeless and criminal justice populations with a continuum of care to prevent psychiatric hospitalizations. With Dr. Quest is Bill Marr, one of the speakers for Stop Stigma California a project working to reduce the stigma and discrimination attached to mental illness. In 2008, Mr. Marr suddenly began suffering from panic attacks. He sought out the Anxiety Treatment Center of Sacramento, where his anxiety was diagnosed and suggestions for real improvement were introduced. He hopes that by sharing his story, he will help us all view mental illness in a completely new way. 
We urge you to tune in next Friday for another important forum topic.